Okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, this is another lecture that's sponsored by the program in political economy here, which has made a terrific contribution to the lives of people in the humanities and social sciences here at Dartmouth. And it's a special pleasure for me to introduce an old friend, Robert Kuttner, Bob Kuttner. Um, we met originally, I think, in 1980. When I first moved to Boston, we were both lamenting the fact that our friendship began with the Reagan administration, which, uh, for, from which we both felt like internal exiles. Um, I think both of us at the time thought we were living through a Sinclair Lewis dystopia and obviously had no imagination for um, what kind of fictions could be produced. Um, we were racquetball partners at one point. I think we were the only people in the uh, Brookline Racquet Club arguing not about who scored the last point, but whether Marx really owes the theory of surplus value to David Ricardo. Um, <laughs> at the time, I was writing uh, mainly to the New York Review about Israel, and Bob was writing about everything else in the world covering the rest of the world for the New Republic. He was the economics editor of the New Republic. Um, and in 1984, published um, a terrific book whose uh, title, I suppose, speaks for itself. The Economic Illusion, False Choices Between Prosperity and Social Justice. Um, he would go on and write yet another book, this time much more focused on the Democratic Party, called it The Light of the Party in 1987. Uh, during this time, he was writing columns for the Boston Globe. Um, that year, in 87, I went to work at the Harvard Business Review. I called up Bob to ask him what uh, an IPO was. I thought it was the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I think also a leverage bio. I think he taught me what a leverage bio. Anyway, I uh, did my homework, uh, and Bob um, went on in 1990, having had enough of the New Republic's regime. Uh, in 1990, 30 years, he'll be celebrating 30 years this year uh, to found the American Prospect, which gave both uh, frame, definition, poignancy to liberalism in this country, what we would, I suppose, now call progressive politics, uh, which he founded in 1990 with Robert Reich, who would then go on to become Labor Secretary and Paul Starr. Um, Bob has been relentless. Um, his latest book is um, Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism, which will be the title of this talk. He's the author of other books, Everything for Sale, The Squandering of America, and in 2008, a particularly prescient and courageous book called Obama's Challenge, in which he began early to question uh, whether the Obama administration would live up to its own hype. Um, while he was doing all of this, he was also a regular columnist for the Huffington Post. Um, this guy works hard. Uh, I remember once hearing Bill McGibbon, um, who was asked what his theory of change was. And McGibbon answered, I'll write an article, and things will change. Um, it didn't turn out exactly that way. Um, and of course, he said it with some uh, sad irony. But I think if there ever will be a time when 
that is a theory of change, when journalists will be able to relentlessly discuss important issues and things will change, it'll be Bob who makes it happen. So it's a great pleasure, Bob, and take it away. And I see this is a university audience. You can see the front row is empty because uh, for some reason people like to sit towards the back. But uh, you have a mic, and I think if you stand down here, you'll be fine. Well, that was great, Bernie. Thanks so much. And uh, it's really a delight to be here. You know, um, if somebody had published a book in, in uh, 30 years ago, in the fall of 1989, whose 30th anniversary we're also celebrating is the fall of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall, but with a title like, Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism? Uh, the response would have been complete bewilderment. I probably couldn't have found a publisher to publish that book uh, in 1989 because the view was that um, capitalism had triumphed and capitalism went hand in hand with liberal democracy. And uh, here we are uh, 30 years later and uh, that, that doesn't seem to be the case uh, at all. So before going into the dynamics of, uh, of what happened, uh, let me take you back to the period between 1933 and roughly 1973, which was uh, unprecedented and unique in the history of capitalism. Uh, first of all, the market economy was harnessed in a broad public interest. And secondly, uh, beginning in the 40s, for a period of about 35 years, the economy not only grew at an unprecedented rate, but it grew more equal, something that has never happened before or since. Thomas Piketty famously computed that the economy wealth tends to concentrate because the return on capital uh, accrues at a faster rate than the, the growth of GDP. Therefore, simply as a matter of mathematics, uh, wealth has to become more concentrated over time. And yet, uh, the period from the 30s through the 70s was a great exception. Uh, Jeff Cowie, a historian, has uh, written a book about the New Deal, uh, which he titled The Great Exception. But really, this was an exceptional period for Western capitalism as a whole. So how did that happen? Well, uh, it took a lot of luck uh, because uh, it's not normal for a capitalist economy where ownership is basically private and the dynamics of the economy are basically capitalist to allow itself to be harnessed in a broad public interest so that uh, ordinary people who are not of the entrepreneurial bent can do uh, well and can get a reasonable share of uh, GDP growth and productivity growth. There's a famous chart uh, originated by the Economic Policy Institute, another uh, left liberal organization that I helped found in the 1980s, which shows productivity growth and um, median income, uh, median wages growing in lockstep until the mid 70s and then the curves go like that. And, uh, Productivity growth slows down a little bit, but it picks back up the trend, but wages just flatline. So something extraordinary happened between the 30s and 70s, and then it reversed after about 1973. Uh, that's the subject of my book um, and this lecture. Now, for starters, if you do this as political history, which is really the only way to do it, um, the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression that followed had a very different political effect than the collapse of 2008. Uh, it disgraced laissez-faire as an ideology, and it disgraced, um, I, I can't quite bring myself to use the word ruling class because I'm not really a Marxist, so I use the word economic elites. It disgraced <laughs> financial elites. And also, there was the happy accident of Roosevelt. 
uh, Roosevelt you know, came in promising to balance the budget. He was kind of a moderately liberal governor of New York, and he became radicalized in office. That, that wasn't quite supposed to happen. And so you had a much tougher harnessing of the market economy than anybody expected. And uh, you had the financial sector in particular treated almost like a public utility. Uh, it was the single most important aspect of the New Deal. The Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1944, 34, and the Public Utility Holding Company Act and the Investment Company Acts of 1940, and on and on and on and on. Uh, four different acts um, almost nationalizing the system of mortgage finance and controls on interest rates through Glass-Steagall and uh, the separation of investment banking and commercial banking. Because the prevailing view, and it was an accurate view despite a lot of latter-day revisionism, was that the conflicts of interest in the financial industry more than anything else had led to toxic speculation that in turn led to a great unwinding and the financial collapse, not unlike what happened in uh, 2008 after much of the New Deal regulatory schema had been undone. And funny thing, in the era of the post-war boom, finance was the servant of the real economy rather than the master. And the real economy did just great. Uh, in fact, for much of that period, real interest rates were negative. The, the war was every bit as important as the New Deal. Because in order to finance the war, you could not let markets set interest rates. The war was financed about 50-50 by surtaxes on high incomes and by public borrowing. But the public borrowing had to be at affordable rates. You couldn't let financial markets set those rates. And so there was a deal between the Treasury and the Fed where interest rates were pegged and the Fed, under the constraints of the wartime emergency, um, agreed to buy whatever the Treasury needed to unload on it at interest rates that averaged about two and a quarter percent. Uh, now, if the most important thing Roosevelt did was to leash finance, the second most important thing he did was to empower labor. And again, this was the only period in the history of capitalism where the government was basically on the side of organized labor. And that produced uh, a kind of equilibrium of power uh, what, what Galbraith would later call countervailing power. And there was a very brief period in the 1940s where industry concluded that, gee, the unions are here to stay. We better get along with them. It wasn't until the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 that uh, industry took the gloves off and started walking away from that social contract. So the, the strong form of that social contract really lasted maybe a decade. But it had a long half-life because the unions had um, an institutional inertial presence and the banks uh, remained uh, leashed in a very salutary way for another few decades. Now, meanwhile, uh, on the other side of the ocean, something really interesting was happening as well. Um, in January of 1933, when Roosevelt was assembling his cabinet in Washington, uh, Hitler was assembling his cabinet in Berlin. And it shows you that social unrest can either go uh, democratic left or it can go fascistic right. And um, the, um, in, in, the result of the Hitler regime in the 1930s, uh, until he blew it all by, by making war, it was very satisfying to most Germans. Uh, Hitler ran a very nice welfare state. And uh, the, the German economy, thanks to rearmament, uh, was the first uh, of the European economies to recover from the Great Depression. So you had this stark choice of whether you uh, recover from a depression through a democracy or through totalitarianism. And very much like today, the view of Mussolini and Hitler and philosophers like Carl Schmitt in Germany was that liberal democracy was doomed. Uh, that um, 
maybe some countries could go through the motions of democracy, as we see in Hungary and Poland and Turkey today. But the idea of liberal democracy, that was silly. And um, Mussolini's favorite uh, philosopher argued that uh, the democracies were doomed because they couldn't solve the problem of membership, because they couldn't solve the problem of unemployment, um, because they couldn't solve the problem of uh, either political security or economic security. Now, what happened, of course, was that the democracies won the war. Mainly the United States won the war, but uh, democracy had a remarkable uh, resurgence after World War II with one important aspect. Uh, all of the great founders of the post-war era, whether they were social democrats or Christian democrats or um, other kinds of democrats, uh, and communists were part of those early coalition governments in Italy and uh, Belgium and France in the 40s. But everybody who tried to put the world back together uh, in uh, beginning in 1944 and 1945 was convinced that um, laissez-faire economics were poisoned. That if you were going to prevent another European war, not only did you need a national and international security system that would leash Germany inside a broader democratic alliance, but you needed a full employment economy. One of the great documents of that era is the first of the two Beveridge reports by Lord Beveridge, who was the architect of the British welfare state. But that was his second report in 1944. His first report in 1942 was called Full Employment in a Free Society. And he begins that uh, document with an epigraph borrowed from Charlotte Bronte, Misery Breeds Hate. And if you want to head off another third fratricidal European war, you need a full employment economy. The welfare state was frosting on the cake. This was Beveridge's great insight. Um, people want to work. People don't want to be on the dole. It's shameful to be on welfare. And if you have unemployment of 8 or 10 or 12 percent, the state goes broke compensating people for the cost and the inconvenience of not working. If you have full employment, that first of all, and I'm paraphrasing Beveridge here, and it's every bit as true today, uh, that gives labor more bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis management. But it also means that you can use tax outlays and tax uh, income on other things. You can build a national health insurance system. You can have free higher education. You can have child care. Rather than spending all that money to keep people from starving because they don't have work. So 1944, of course, was also the, the year of the Bretton Woods Conference. And um, the chairman of the conference was, was Keynes. Now, unlike most great historical figures, Keynes got, got a chance for a do-over. Uh, you may recall that Keynes was uh, Her Majesty's, or His Majesty's, I guess, in that era, uh, special advisor to the Treasury at the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919, which was the most catastrophic missteps in the history of the world. And uh, the victorious powers who had lost uh, horribly, they'd lost, as the saying goes, blood and treasure and uh, the lives of flower of a whole generation in World War I. And they decided that this was all the fault of the Germans and that the Germans would pay all the cost of the war damage known as reparations. Keynes, who was in his mid-30s at the time, being a very fine economist, calculated that there was no way that Germany could possibly pay. And uh, wrote very presciently that if the Allies were to squeeze Germany in this fashion, rather than helping Germany to recover, the result would be a second uh, European war. And so he left the Versailles Conference early. He resigned his post. He wrote a letter to Lloyd George and uh, spent several weeks feverishly writing a book, which was uh, titled The Economic Consequences of the Peace, uh, warning what a catastrophe uh, the Versailles peace settlement was. But the catastrophe did not just extend to the reparations that were 
wreaked upon Germany. It extended to the conservative economics that dominated the 1920s. Uh, there was no recovery plan for Europe, unlike after the Second War. Uh, the economy was completely speculative. The war debts were refinanced uh, by, by private financiers who wanted to make as much money as possible. And uh, the idea was to squeeze the Germans both to pay back the debts as well as to pay reparations. Right up until the election of 1933, which brought Hitler to power, the predecessor coalition government had been pursuing the advice of the experts and the demands of the creditors and had been pursuing austerity economics. Um, so there are awful parallels uh, here. So in 1944, in June of 1944 at the ski resort of Bretton Woods, when uh, representatives of uh, 44 nations gathered to fashion the architecture of the post-war economic and trade and financial regime, Keynes was the chairman of the conference. He was 62 years old. He was now Baron Keynes of Tilton and the world's most celebrated economist. And Keynes had concluded both from the lessons of Versailles and from his own work in the intervening 25 years that culminated in, uh, in his general theory that not only did you need a domestic economy with a bias towards growth and full employment, but you needed an international environment, an international financial environment that allowed domestic full employment economies to thrive. Also unprecedented uh, in, the, in the history of the world. And so the architecture of Bretton Woods was very deliberately intended to restrain the toxic influence of speculative finance globally. Uh, how did Keynes propose to do that? Well, uh, first of all, exchange rates were fixed. That meant that um, there was no speculation in currency parities. Wiped out a whole category of speculation. Secondly, uh, there were capital controls that actually lasted well into the 1960s that were gradually uh, taken off, but it meant that during the crucial years of the post-war recovery, uh, a whole other category of speculation was just a not on the table because it wasn't possible. Those were the two aspects of the Bretton Woods architecture that endured. The, the other two aspects were too radical. Uh, they were too radical for the Americans who had all the power and all the money, and um, they were utopian. One was the idea that there should be a global currency. Uh, Keynes called it Bancor, punning on the French words for bank and gold. And the other idea was that there would be an international monetary fund from which countries uh, could just borrow at will. Keynes euphemistically called these overdrafts. And the idea was that if you got into balance of payments difficulties, uh, the IMF just had to give you as much money as you needed to cover them. And the, the core insight was right, that instead of the creditor nations demanding that the debtor nations contract, the, the debtor nations could be allowed to, to expand so that the whole system would have a bias towards growth. Well, in the event, um, neither the design of Keynes um, nor the design of his uh, radical American counterpart, Harry Dexter White, was, was what was actually enacted at Bretton Woods, but the dollar was the de facto global currency, so that was good enough for a while. And uh, um, the Marshall Plan, much more than the World Bank, which was the other part of Bretton Woods, became the, the, the engine of capital transfers to help Europe recover. There was a third entity that was still born called the International Trade Organization, a uh, really interesting uh, historical artifact. Uh, it was the effort of the the radicals who were in charge in that era to reconcile relatively open trade with labor rights. And one of the provisions of the uh, International Trade Organization, which was never ratified by the US Senate, was that if um, you were trying to defend a regime of robust labor rights and somebody else's exports were undercutting that because they uh, didn't have labor rights at home, 
or they didn't allow free trade unions, or they had sub-minimum wages. You had the right to levy countervailing tariffs to prevent your system from having to import the toxic labor standards along with the products. Now, that was actually drafted and um, signed off on at Havana in 1948-49, but it was never ratified by the U.S. Senate. But it gives you a picture of what the aspirations of that era uh, were like. Okay, uh, that stuck to the wall as a regime until the early 1970s. And um, I have my, one of my favorite chapters in this book is called A Tale of Two Socialists. So socialist number one is Clement Attlee, the, the first uh, member of the British Labor Party to lead a majority government that actually had the power to get things done. And Attlee comes to power in July of 1945, beating Winston Churchill. Now you say, wow, the British people actually voted out Winston Churchill. He saved their country. Why'd they do that? Uh, well, Britain, during the entire interwar period, because of the dominance of austerity economics, never fell below 10% unemployment. And not only that, but the election of 1940, which was supposed to be held on the fifth anniversary of the election of 1935, was never held because of the wartime emergency. So there had not been an election in Britain uh, since 1935. And people, as much as they admired and appreciated Churchill, were just fed up with all of the wartime privations. Britain, uh, even though Britain was never invaded, a million dwellings were lost by the Blitz. And uh, there was rationing throughout the war right up to about 1950. And Britain really suffered horribly. So the Brits were, were up for a change. And Attlee came in uh, with, a, with a very big labor majority, democratic socialist, uh, promising uh, a very robust welfare state as well as a full employment economy. Uh, Attlee kept uh, income surtax rates on very wealthy people at their wartime level of 99%. Uh, of, uh, but Britain comes out of the war having lost uh, many of its colonies and having lost one quarter of its total national wealth and having a debt to GDP ratio of 240%. Now, if you were the IMF of 2019, the same good people who have been advising what to do about Greece, you would have said to Brother Attlee, you know, uh, your most important job is to reassure creditors because you need private capital. And so um, you can't do any of this. In fact, you need to run a budgetary surplus and you need to tighten your belt. Mercifully, there was no such IMF in that era. So what did Attlee do? Well, he built the National Health Insurance, uh, National Health Service. Uh, he started down the road of free higher education. He uh, rebuilt the British economy with uh, extraordinary public works, uh, nationalized banks and railroads and coal mines. And uh, why didn't the world's capitalists undo that. Why? Because the rules of the game prohibited them from doing that. You could not drive the pound into the ground because the rate of the pound against the dollar was fixed and the various parties to the Bretton Woods Accord were, were pledged to maintain that parity. In fact, the pound was devalued somewhat in 1949. But for those crucial years, you could not bet against the British economy because the rules of the game prohibited it. So in my tale of two socialists, the other socialist is Francois Mitterrand, who becomes uh, elected as the first socialist president of France with a working majority in 1981 with a program very much like Attlee's. And um, France's debt to GDP ratio was very modest. Uh, France's fiscal affairs were in very good order. And uh, Mitterrand, this is uh, 1981, after the kind of really rough decade of the 70s, comes to office and um, is going to nationalize some industries, some banks, going to cut the work week to 37 and a half hours, 
uh, promises all kinds of enhanced benefits. But since 1944, between 1944 and 1981, the rules of the game have been changed. Uh, the capitalists, who had been leashed in a very salutary way, had clawed back most of their power. And so most of the constraints on international finance had been loosened. And it took about a year and a half for international financial markets, God bless them, to drive the franc into the ground. And uh, Mitterrand had to devalue three times, and he had to do a humiliating 180, where he appointed uh, Jacques Delors, who later became the architect of the EU, to preside over what some people called austerity with a human face. At least as socialists, if we have to have austerity, maybe we can make it not quite so bad. And so the difference between Atlee and Mitterrand was simply the result of changes in the rules of the international financial game. And what happens after 1981 is the ascendancy of neoliberalism. And my other favorite chapter uh, in this book is called The Disgrace of the Center Left, where uh, parties and leaders who were nominally center left, like uh, Clinton in the United States, or uh, Schroeder uh, in, in Germany, or Tony Blair in Britain, decide, you know, uh, neoliberalism is the next new thing, and we better get with the program. And so um, Clinton becomes an even more passionate uh, advocate of financial deregulation, uh, Bob Rubin and Larry Summers, than the Republicans who came before him. And uh, Schroeder uh, changes the rules of the German economy as a, as a social democrat uh, in ways that conservatives would never have dared. Uh, there, were, there were tight constraints on uh, financial speculation. Uh, there were interlocks between banks and large corporations that were very carefully monitored by the government, which meant that corporations had the benefit of patient capital. Uh, Schroeder, thinking that neoliberalism was both sound economics as well as fashionable, wanted more speculation. Uh, under Schroeder, um, the protections of uh, German labor were uh, loosened so that labor could become more like a spot market. Now, because uh, Germany was such an export powerhouse, uh, Germany itself did not suffer the consequences. Because once the euro came in, uh, Germany had a kind of permanently undervalued currency. If Germany had kept the Deutschmark, the Deutschmark would have been revalued, 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 as it had been prior to the uh, advent of the euro. But Germany was like typhoid Mary. Everybody else got sick. Uh, Germany uh, did not get sick. And so uh, during this period in the late 90s, when you had leaders nominally of the center left, they uh, really reinforced the, the consensus of neoliberalism. And let me say a word about neoliberalism. Um, some people use it as an epithet. I think it's a very useful descriptive term. It means simply the belief that the verities of free market economics, despite the unfortunate experience of the Great Depression, turn out to be true after all. And the neo part is really who is embracing the verities of 19th century classical economics and the fact that despite the historic lessons of the Great Depression on the one hand and the success of the post-war mixed economy, that somehow uh, free market economics uh, turned out to be right after all. Now, let's go back to the, the verities of, of 1989. Uh, in that period, there was a view that uh, capitalism, uh, raw in tooth and claw, as Maggie Thatcher liked to say, um, and democracy naturally go together. Now, anybody who has studied history would raise an eyebrow at that. I mean, for starters, um, capitalists have just gotten along with dictatorships from Latin America to plundering natural resources in Africa to China. Uh, just beautifully. And tragically, we see how nicely uh, capitalists get along with aspiring dictators in the United States of America under, uh, under Donald Trump. 
Um, secondly, the expansion of democracy has gone hand in hand with the leashing of capitalism, not with the unleashing of capitalism. There's a favorite piece of statuary of mine um, that is on the corner of uh, Constitution Avenue where it meets Independence Avenue. Uh, it dates to about 1938 and it was commissioned when the Federal Trade Commission building was built. And it shows a wild horse being broken by a horseman and harnessed. And that was the symbol in the Roosevelt era of commerce being constrained in the broad public interest. I've often thought that if that statue had been commissioned today, it would show the rider dragging the, uh, the horse dragging the rider haplessly up Constitution Avenue because that is the, that is the prevailing ethic. Um, so what's the globalization part? Um, and let me take you now to 19, 73. Uh, why did things fall apart in the early 70s? Well, again, very much like the historical accident of Roosevelt and the historical accident of who the founders of the Bretton Woods system were, there were a bunch of historical accidents that mixed with some structural factors. The other thing I meant to mention was that, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll save that for the Q&A. Um, so the dollar um, succeeded in functioning as the de facto global currency uh, in a fixed exchange rate regime until the early 70s. And there was a very prescient economist uh, named Robert Triffin, Belgian-born economist whose career was mostly in the United States, who warned that this could not continue indefinitely, that if other economies are growing, and we expect the United States to provide them with enough dollars so that they can grow, at some point the inflationary pressures on the dollar are going to become insurmountable and you're going to get inflation and the dollar is going to have to be devalued. Uh, Lyndon Johnson accelerated that day of reckoning uh, with his spending for the Vietnam War and his effort to have both guns and butter as the expression went in that day. And then of course the, the timing of the uh, 1973 war in the Middle East and the um, fact that Nixon was otherwise engaged with trying to save his own skin at Watergate made it possible for the oil exporting companies to uh, uh, form OPEC and jack up the price of oil. So you have this convergence of events that translate into a period of inflation and stagflation, something that's not supposed to happen at the same time. And um, in the first phase of this, it, it, it all proves a too much for Bretton Woods. So in 1973, when um, all of the world's major nations, central bank chairs and finance ministers, are trying to figure out how to have a graceful, stable transition from uh, the fixed exchange rate of the Bretton Woods regime to something uh, that, that would maintain the stability uh, but involve uh, more flexibility. Um, Nixon is trying to save his own neck. So here is a scrap of tape from the Watergate tapes of June 23rd, 1973, as the financial system is descending into chaos and it's a exchange, Nixon of course famously taped himself, bugged himself, uh, between the president and his chief of staff, H.R. Uh, Bob Haldeman, and I am not making this up. <clears throat> Haldeman, did you get the report that the British floated the pound? Nixon, no, I don't think so. Haldeman, they did. Nixon, that's the valuation? Haldeman, yeah, Flanagan's got a report on it here. I don't, Nixon, I don't care. Nothing we can do about it. Haldeman, you want to run down? No, I don't. Haldeman, he argues that it shows the wisdom of our refusal to consider convertibility until we get a new monetary system. Nixon, good, I think he's right. It's too complicated for me to get into. Haldeman, Burns, the Fed chairman, expects a 5% devaluation against the dollar. 
Nixon. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, Haldeman. Burns is concerned about speculation against the lira. Nixon. Well, I don't give a shit about the lira. So on such accidental convergences, uh, history is, uh, is made or unmade. So what about the title of this talk in my book, uh, Globalization? Well, what happens beginning in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s is that the general agreement on tariffs and trade, which had been a fairly benign standing diplomatic conference to negotiate reciprocal trade, uh, reciprocal reductions in tariffs. You cut your tariff, I cut my tariff. Uh, in the 90s, mutates into a general um, wrecking ball to undermine managed capitalism country by country. And in the Uruguay round of trade negotiations, which led to the creation of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, which was the successor to the GATT, there are all of these new issues. Uh, trade in services. Well, trade in services really means free trade in financial services, which really means deregulation of banks. And uh, you can go sector by sector by sector and point out how uh, hyper-liberalized trade and hyper-liberalized free movement of capital and goods and services leads to the undermining of the ability nation by nation to manage capitalism, which of course had been Keynes's goal uh, at Bretton Woods in, uh, in 1944. The Europeans through the EU had their own version of this on one continent. The Maastricht Treaty, which is the closest thing to uh, a fundamental constitution of the European Union, it's, its most fundamental doctrine is free movement of capital, goods, services, and persons, which means that whole categories of perfectly normal regulation are hosed away. For instance, um, you may have heard of the Davis-Bacon Act. The Davis-Bacon Act in the United States provides that if you are a federal, if you are benefiting from federal money on a public works contract, you, you have to pay prevailing wages. You can't use that to bust unions. Well, the Germans have their own version of it. And uh, it, it allows the German states to demand decent wages on public construction contracts. Well, um, that flies in the face of the Maastricht rules. So there was a famous uh, decision of the European Court of Justice, uh, the Rufer decision, where a German contractor wanted to use a Polish subcontractor to pay substandard wages on a public works project in one of the German states. And the German states said, well, no, you can't do that. You've got to pay decent wages. And they, the, the company uh, appeals this to the European Court of Justice. And uh, the ECJ says, sorry, that regulation is scrapped. And there have been case after case after case where, um, in the case of uh, Sweden, uh, a, a company comes in from Estonia that refuses to abide by Sw uh, Swedish collective bargaining norms. And the European Court of Justice says, sorry, under the Maastricht rules, that's their right. And I have a whole couple of chapters on all of the ways that this doctrine of free movement of capital goods, people, and services um, undermines the ability of European member states to have managed capitalism. Then there's also another aspect of globalization, which is refugees. And it, it, it's really, and there are two faces of this. I mean, there are the kind of refugees from Syria or Africa who are causing one set of uh, pressures. But there's another category, which is economic refugees from Eastern Europe who are coming into countries and uh, don't have the same labor rights as the locals making the locals very unhappy. Um, so, you know, it's hard enough to expect local people to open their hearts and their borders to people who are culturally different when times are good. When unemployment is 10%, which is the fruit of austerity economics in Europe, then you're really playing with fire. 
And the, the great profit of how this all works is less uh, Karl Marx than Karl Polanyi. Because who, who's read Karl Polanyi? Judas Priest. Who's heard of Karl Polanyi? Okay. No, it's Polanyi. Polanyi. Yeah. Okay. One more time. Who's, who's heard of Karl Polanyi? Okay, that's better. So in that same year, 1944, Polanyi wrote his masterwork, The Great Transformation. And um, Marx had expected that when uh, things got really bad, the workers of the world would unite. What Polanyi appreciated was, no, the workers of the world don't unite. They turn to ultra-nationalists, and they turn to neo-fascists. And that's exactly what's happened in much of Europe uh, as times have gotten bad uh, since 1989. Certainly what happened in the United States, where economic predictability and living standards have been either flat or declining for ordinary people uh, for 40 years. And both parties have colluded in the, in the resurrection of the supremacy of, uh, and again, I'm really trying hard not to sound Marxian, but the world has gotten more Marxian, uh, in the resurrection of the power of finance. Uh, so at some point, when Hillary Clinton is running against Donald Trump and taking $500,000 honoraria from Wall Street, the average person says, there really isn't any difference between the two parties. I can take my poison this way, I can take my poison that way, and maybe it's time just to look for somebody who's gonna blow the whole thing up. And that's, I think, the main reason that we got Trump and Orban on Erdogan and the whole gang of uh, aspiring uh, neo-fascists. So, uh, uh, in conclusion, and my, my mentor, Professor Galbraith, said you always have to say in conclusion to give the audience hope. Um, <laughs> in conclusion, to answer my own question, uh, can democracy survive global capitalism? Yes, it can, but it will take a lot more democracy and a lot less capitalism. Thank you very much. So we're going to go to questions, and uh, as the uh, convener, I'm going to uh, take a crack at the first one just to uh, give you all a chance to uh, follow a stupid one. Um, there, there isn't in your schema um, much um, analysis of any technological changes that we may have lived through in the last two decades. And I know you have opinions about this. Um, I'd like you particularly to focus on the distinction between unemployment and unemployability. We've been talking about this for a long time. I even wrote in the American Prospect about this a uh, long time ago. We, we have now um, a different kind of crisis. And, I'm, and that has to do with um, the incapacity of many people to qualify for the kinds of jobs that are actually potentially available to them in this part of the world. Because there's an aspect of globalization, of course, which has to do with the way corporations work today, globally. Um, what, what do you see as relevant to them? You know, the, 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 I'm, I'm speaking now about the crisis of those parts of America where, you know, you had two, three percent of people on disability 10, 15 years ago, now 12 percent on disability. People, people who seem to see their, their local communities falling apart. There are quite a few people in the current presidential race who are raising these questions. And I'm wondering how you see what, what you, I think, correctly say about the 40s and 50s and, and see what you can say to apply to the peculiar crisis that you see today. We didn't rehearse this. 
as, as we say at the Passover, I'm very glad you asked that question. Um, so I'm something of a radical on this, so let me, let me just say what I think. Um, I'm quoting Robert Frank here. Um, Technology is not the cause of this. Technology is the excuse for not doing anything about it. And let me begin this uh, sort of counter narrative by invoking some history. Uh, 1940, eight years of Roosevelt, the unemployment rate is 13.8%. And there are a lot of mainstream and even left of center economists saying, you know what, uh, it's automation. Uh, this is the best a capitalist economy can do. We better get used to it. We better find ways of subsidizing these people or maybe teaching them some other way to make a living, but this is just a chronic problem. Then the Japanese were kind enough to bomb Pearl Harbor. And in the course of six months, uh, the, war, the, the War Department enters orders of $50 billion and unemployment disappears. Uh, in fact, there's over full employment. Uh, they, have to, uh, they have to allow women and Negroes to work on war production lines with men and with white people. Um, and a lot of the people who were trained to work on war production lines hadn't graduated sixth grade. They were illiterate, but they were trained uh, on the job. So that's point number one. Ah, but you will say, that was the factory economy. This is the post-industrial economy. So there is a parable that the Nobel laureate Vasily Leontiev liked to tell, and this is 1975. And Leontiev said, uh, what do we do when the entire economy is so productive that there is one human worker and her job is to flip the switch? Then the only questions become, who gets the benefit of all that productive wealth and what does everybody do for what does everybody else do for a living? And so uh, the practical question becomes: since factory jobs are not coming back, either because of outsourcing or because of automation, or or both, what does everybody do for a living? And who owns all that productive wealth? Now, um, one of the benefits of a so-called Green New Deal, the the massive public infrastructure program, part of that. Uh, is that it creates a ton of jobs. Some of those are blue collar jobs, some of them aren't. Some of them are jobs that help create new technologies which in turn produce new employment as happened uh, during the war. I mean, a Green New Deal is really World War II without the war. But inevitably, most of the jobs in the economy are, are gonna be uh, service sector jobs. Now, I think of focus on human capital is a complete cop-out by political centrists who don't want to take on the deeper structural problems of capitalism because that makes it the fault of the worker. And you, you invest heroically in human capital and then, hey, where are the jobs? And the jobs are still not there and the jobs are still uh, not paying decently. Hyman Minsky, who was another great dissenting economist, always argued, get to full employment first with decent wages and then do the training. And that's better than somehow assuming that uh, if you train these people, that will somehow cycle through into the creation of jobs. There was a, a, a wonderful piece that Arlie Hochschild, the sociologist, wrote about three months ago now in the New York Times called Silicon Holler, H-O-L-L-E-R, as in West Virginia and Kentucky. And she said, and she's worked with a, a congressman uh, Silicon Valley, weirdly enough, has a lefty congressman named Ro Khanna. And Ro Khanna has worked with Republicans. And his idea is, hey, let's spread the tech around. And so uh, there was a pilot project which uh, trained kids in Kentucky and West Virginia to learn how to be coders. So that instead of aspiring to work at Walmart for seven bucks an hour, um, they could get jobs for $60 an hour that can just as easily go to Kentucky as, as they can go to Bangalore. So I think if we can commit the sin of economic planning, which we did during the war, and which we'll have to do under the rubric of a Green New Deal, we, we can spread some of the wealth around. The, the original New Deal uh, 
among all of its other accomplishments, was a regional economic development program. Um, TVA was a regional economic development program. I'm a big fan of pork barrel. I mean, about 10 years ago, the idea was that we should get rid of earmarks because earmarks are corrupting. The great thing about pork barrel is that you spread the wealth around, excuse me, and Congress people of both parties vote for extensive uh, public works. That still leaves the question of what about the rest of the service economy? And um, it's, it's very possible to stipulate, if you have the votes, um, that anybody who works taking care of old people or young people or sick people shall make at least $40,000 a year. And we will provide training as necessary to make sure that that happens. In France, um, they have a requirement that they have the, the world's best early childhood program. And they have a requirement that uh, a teacher in a creche maternelle, the very, very early childhood program, has to have uh, more academic credentials in child development and public health than a kindergarten teacher because the, the work is more uh, intense. And so they get more money than, um, uh, than your average school teacher. When Jacques Delors, to his great chagrin, was presiding over the partial dismantling of the French welfare state, one of the things he took great pride in was he didn't let them throw that one on the fire. So I think if, if most jobs are going to be service jobs, then that's really a question of redistribution of wealth. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Um, in your description of the decline of the, of the post-war mixed economy as it hit the 1970s, the inflationary pressures of the 1970s, you suggest that um, the rules of the game can be set by governments as governments please. And I'm just curious, do you think that like a government could just set an exchange rate as it pleases could, and just say that it would be five pounds to the dollar and, and, and fix trade, you know, fixed exchange rates? Could we go back to fixed exchange rates at a kind of fiat basis? No but we can take a lot of the profit out of speculation. So governments did not have to allow credit default swaps. Governments did not have to allow LBOs. Governments did not have to allow Goldman to play these games where you better not prohibit us from doing this because New York will do it in London. And you know, the Tobin tax, uh, uh, a very small tax on uh, financial transactions. Uh, Tobin came up with this in 1972 when Bretton Woods was falling apart as, as a way, uh, he actually used the phrase, which is sort of the, the ultimate sin in economics, of throwing sand in the gears. That's the last thing you want. You want smooth equilibrium. But Tobin's point was that when it comes to financial markets, y you need a little sand in the gears to keep financial markets from just running right and taking over everything. So no, you can't fix exchange rates by fiat, I agree with you, but you can take a lot of the profit out of the speculation and damp down the purely speculative aspects of the financial economy. But by the uh, Simon Johnson, who was the former chief economist of uh, the IMF, calculated that by, 19, by 2007, on the, on the eve of a financial collapse, about 45% of the profits in the entire US economy were going to the financial sector. Now, that's not because the financial sector was providing that much benefit. That was pure monopoly rents. So you can, you, can, you can shrink it back down to a size where you can understand it, and then you can regulate it. And then uh, floating exchange rates become less uh, destabilizing for the system. And that, that was Tobin's view. I mean, I, I don't think anybody thought after 73 or 74 that you could rescue fixed exchange rates. You had this whole period of trying to ex uh, experiment with different kinds of managed flows, which, which finally ended with, with the euro, which didn't really work out all that well either. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to ask you about the world today. Um, in my reading group with Professor Clark, we're learning that the world, particularly in the last 30 years since neoliberalism has become the dominant economic force, the world's gotten a lot better. Uh, poverty rates have plummeted. Meanwhile, education rates, vaccination rates, all of these have skyrocketed. 
Um, the countries, however, where that are not democratic, the countries that are failing, while most countries are growing, are the countries with low economic freedom that leads to authoritarianism. You see Russia, China, Belarus, Venezuela is the perfect example. I don't understand how you can equate capitalism with the fall of democracy when you see that countries with heavy economic freedom are often countries with a lot of personal freedom, whereas countries with low economic freedom often are run by authoritarian governments. Well, that's the received wisdom, and you've summarized it very well, but let's unpack that. So most of the, statistically, most of the decline in extreme poverty has occurred in one country, and of course that's China. Sorry? Mm, to some extent, but China more so. And um, China is, uh, it's a one-party state, it's an authoritarian country run by the Communist Party, and yeah, there is a capitalist sector, but the capitalist sector dare not fall afoul of uh, government. Uh, there's no press freedom, there are no Western-style democratic freedoms. Um, and China, and to a lesser extent, Korea and Japan, which are democracies, have broken all the rules of free market capitalism. They have been state-led, mercantilist, managed capitalism in a different way, not Keynesian welfare state, but cartels with government planning and government capital and uh, a great deal of protectionism against uh, other people's exports, and a financial sector that you know, ought to be completely dysfunctional uh, but somehow soldiers on and provides capital to the rest of the economy. So India, um, <laughs> India is a, is a quite corrupt, increasingly one-party country. I, I don't think uh, India is what Western advocates of liberal democracy exactly had in mind. And the fact of the matter is that the Western heartland of liberal democracy, uh, maybe a trillion people, has become both less democratic and less prosperous in the past 15 years, the 20 years, the years of neoliberalism, and the wealth has become hyper-concentrated. Uh, so even if economic growth has not been all that bad on average, and it's been terrible on average in Europe, it, it has gone to a tiny, tiny fraction of, of people. So I think, you know, depending on your priors, um, you can look at the world and tell a story that uh, the countries that have done well have been the countries that have unleashed free markets. I just don't think that corresponds to the fact. Well, I mean, just, <clears throat> so India, you know, in 2004, you got 38.9% of the population in poverty. 2011, it's 21.2%. I mean, when you adjust for a country, but it's a lot of people. But and you attribute that to what kind of economics? Well, in the 1990s, it opens up. It's a very insular state from independence to 1990, when they have their currency crisis. They have no choice but to open up. They can sell their stuff to the rest of the world. I mean, that's just the World Bank data. It's actually not my question. My question is, so France, and this is an honest question, so France would hew more closely to many of the policies you would advocate. So you still have a more strongly unionized labor force, you know, a shorter work week to try to do, and so on. And yet the French appear to be as unhappy or unhappier than everybody else. And so, and, so what is going on in France? You know, Daniel Bell, the sociologist, once said something very wise. He said, for example, is not an argument. So I think what's happened throughout the West is we've had a slowdown in economic growth, certainly since 2007. And we've had a hyper-concentration of the growth that has existed. And I think in this uh, environment of global or European neoliberalism, uh, it becomes harder and harder and harder to maintain any kind of a mixed economy in, in one state. Um, if you want somebody who is a better credential economist than I am to really make this argument with all the algebra and all the statistics and all the bells and whistles, I commend Danny Rodman. 
who does this just flawlessly. And you look at Scandinavia, which um, managed to square that circle for maybe 50 years, where you had um, very high rates of unionization, you had uh, free trade, you did not have state planning. A lot of this was just bargain between the unions and management. It was very decentralized. Um, and happiness uh, surveys showed that Scandinavians were among the world's happiest people. That's been blown to smithereens. You, you can't do that anymore because of the rules of the EU. So I'm just saying that uh, under the best of circumstances, this kind of social contract where you have a balancing act between the entrepreneurial part of the economy and the social part of the economy, that's very difficult to do economically. It's even harder to do politically because uh, wealthy people don't like to be constrained. And sooner or later, they get back the power that's been taken away from them. But um, paradoxically, even though the EU was supposed to be a blend of markets and social protections, the austerity mongers and the uh, free movement of everything liberalist people have gotten so tight control of the rules of the EU that countries that want to pursue a continuing kind of managed capitalism can't do it anymore. So, um, it was hard under the best of circumstances, and it's, uh, it's even harder now. And this is Polanyi once again. This is what has bred the ultranationalist reaction. And it's not a coincidence that in country after country after country after country, you have a nationalist far right that doesn't really care about democratic niceties, that is rekindling nationalist animosities that were supposedly buried in the good years after the war, that is anti-Brussels because they see Brussels bringing in a kind of globalization that they don't like, but that doesn't have any kind of a coherent counter story or counter ideology uh, other than hating foreigners and hating cosmopolitans. And I think uh, this is a reaction to what Danny Roderick calls uh, hyperglobalization. So in a sense, democracy is being narrowed on both flanks. On the one hand, uh, decisions that used to be able to be made democratically by nation states and by citizens are now made by market forces and by financial elites. And on the other flank, the, the rise of neo-fascism has made it harder and harder and harder for mainstream parties to govern. If you have a splitter, not a splitter, but if you have a powerful party on the far right with uh, 20, 25% of the vote, uh, then you never get a governing party that is strong enough to govern. You have weak coalition governments, very much like what happened in the 20s, and so you muddle along and kick the can down the road, and none of these problems get solved, and then that produces even more support for, for neo-fascist uh, ultranationalist parties. So um, I don't... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead for you. Um, so, so earlier you kind of mentioned the fact that a lot of people want jobs, and so you kind of dragged uh, capitalism and like the current um, dictatorship um, as far right, where capitalists basically um, take over the country like dictators. Uh, I was just wondering, like, when you deregulate and you have a freer enterprise and market, you create more jobs, so people uh, will get jobs. Um, you argue that maybe a person is just flip, flicking the, the switch, and that's meaningless. But let's say you have a government and a government going to push the Green New Deal, and you guarantee everyone to get a job, but then the job would be as meaningless, just like in um, Soviet Union, where there was a uh, the ideas of like one person digging a hole and six persons supervising. Um, so when you're putting all the power into the state, um, you are essentially trying to push out private enterprise. And how are you gonna? Um, how are you gonna protect the ideas that 
um, the, the far right, the people who are for deregulation are actually the one that are, um, yeah, they are actually the one that are snaking everyone's first off when they are actually giving them more freedom. Okay, so let me, let me take each piece of that one at a time. Um, if you had a program of upgrading of public infrastructure, everything from the electrical grid to uh, decent public transit, that would not be like the Soviet Union where you have uh, you know, a person digging a hole and six people supervising him. That would be useful work modernizing systems. If you travel by rail from Boston to uh, Washington, you pass through a museum of 19th century infrastructure. I looked it up. The fastest train from New York to Chicago, which is now called the Lakeshore Limited, was called the 20th Century Limited in 1908, and it was an hour faster in 1908. You go to Germany, or you go to Beijing, or lots of other parts of China, you see a country that's modernized its infrastructure. We haven't done that. So that's low-hanging fruit. That's, that's easy to do, and it creates uh, lots of good jobs. And by the way, if you look at what happened in World War II, where the government had more power than it's ever had before or since, that was really good for private enterprise. Because private enterprise got all those contracts. It wasn't the War Department that was building the planes and the tanks and the guns. It was contractors. And after the war, all those plants were sold back to private companies very cheap. So I don't think the United States will ever be like Soviet Russia because I think there's a residual amount of support for private industry. We're talking about partnerships between public purposes and private industry where the actual work is done by private industry and private industry gets the benefit of all that capital to innovate. So that's, that's, that's point one. And um, you look at the countries that are doing this well, they are anything but traditional free market countries, China being uh, the, the prime example, where uh, they're building incredible amounts of high-speed rail. They are not only building coal-fired electrical plants, but they're building more solar plants. Uh, this is not catch-up technology. This is leading technology. And yeah, there are some private companies in China, but the whole show is state-led. And so I don't hold up China as a model of liberal democracy, but I do hold up China as a model of what's possible to do with public planning. Do you think that for the United States, institutions are an insurmountable barrier to having more democracy? Like when we think about the Supreme Court, for example, in the last couple of years with Citizens United and with decisions that have curbed unions, political rights, and, um, and empowered corporations. And then we also think about the Senate. But I read that like, if trends continue by 2040, half the population will be in eight states. So the other half will have 84 senators compared to 16. So how will, will these trends get in the way, even if we have like eight years of President Warren and then eight years of President Ocasio-Cortez, will these institutional <laughs> factors make it, make it impossible for there to be increased democracy to the extent that we can go back to yeah. what's happened in the past? It's a great question. So some of this goes back to the Constitution, right? The framers were very skeptical of government, and they created a, con a Constitution that made it very hard for government to be activist because of all the checks and balances. Then, um, since really since World War II, we've had a number of assaults on democracy that, that culminated with President Trump. We had an expansion of executive power. Uh, we had uh, a weakening of civic institutions. We had money crowding out citizen activism. We've now had the federal government go from a champion of expanding the right to vote to the federal government and the states under Trump trying to constrict the right to vote. We've got a reactionary Supreme Court. Um, however, 
there are historic moments when the pendulum swings and uh, you can get majorities in Congress that are big enough to uh, overcome that. The two great examples on the progressive side are, of course, the Roosevelt Coalition and the period of Johnson and uh, Great Society before he blew it all on, on Vietnam, where you had working majorities in favor of really drastic social reforms. The example on the conservative side is Reagan and, and Trump's two years, although I wouldn't really call Trump conservative. So in order for someone like Elizabeth Warren to get elected, which is the easy part, governing is the hard part, and be able to govern, the Democrats would have to take back the Senate. That's possible. There are 11 vulnerable Republican seats. Uh, the Democrats only need three or four, depending on whether they hold on to Alabama. And there are eight more vulnerable Republican seats in 2022. But um, you're right. Ev everything would have to break right now. And uh, that requires a lot more than luck. It requires a huge amount of mobilization. Uh, it requires Wall Street uh, not to put up uh, Bloomberg as a third party spoiler, which I think could very well happen. And if that happens, and Trump has a hardcore 40% of the vote, uh, Bloomberg as an independent candidate could end up electing Trump. So this is by no means a slam dunk, and it's very difficult. But I don't think it's quite impossible. Uh, kind of add on to that question. It's like assuming that all of those things happened, what could be done to ensure that like, those reforms stayed in place on the, you know, the previous era, like in the 70s, 80s, when those were all a little bad? Or is there nothing that can really be done? I commend you a book uh, recently written by my colleague Paul Stark called The French which looks at the question of why some reforms stick and others don't. And the, the epic example of a reform that has stuck is Social Security, because too many people depend on it. And Social Security is called the third rail of American politics, and it is. Uh, even right-wingers uh, don't dare mess with it except by, by stealth, and it endures to this day. Another wonderful example is the uh, Alaska Permanent Fund, which is a, also a model of how you spread the wealth around. So in 1972, uh, oil is discovered on uh, Alaska's North Slope. And the governor at the time is a maverick Republican who says, Gee, you know what, instead of giving away all these royalties to the oil companies, why don't we just put them on contract to drill for the oil why don't we take the royalty? And so every year, every man, woman, and child in Alaska gets a check from the Alaskan government um, that in some native villages equals more than half of the total cash income. It, depending on the price of oil any given year, it's five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 a person. A lot of money. Now, um, the oil companies have tried to claw this back. Um, Conservative governors have tried to claw this back. Good luck. If you got a check from the government every year of three or four or five or six or seven thousand dollars in free money, no politician is going to take that away from you. And uh, there's a there's a wonderful book, um, and I'm going to in a moment think of the name of the author, but his point is. Uh, let's use the Alaska Permanent Fund as a model for spreading the wealth around so that besides extractive industries, uh, economic functions where the government plays a role, patents, trademarks, copyrights, the internet, uh, NIH, NSF funded stuff, uh, the citizen ought to get a cut of that. Everybody got a check from the government as, as their share of of economic wealth that was extracted from the commons, either either literally or figuratively. The author's name is Peter Barnes, B-A-R-N-E-S. And to go back to Leontief's parable, this is something we're going to have to figure out. Because if, if we do go to a world where there are fewer and fewer uh, manufacturing jobs, we're already almost there, and where some service sector jobs are taken over by machines, we're going to have to figure out how to uh, distribute that productive wealth more equitably so you know we don't get to a world where 
50 billionaires own half the wealth. And that's the world that we're heading to. Which, by the way, which, by the way, is incompatible with democracy. Uh, I'm wondering how you see uh, the world, capitalism and democracy, managing the enormous changes that will need to happen to enact and make progress with the Green New Deal, especially considering the massive power of the oil industry. Well, um, you know, Roosevelt famously in his second uh, acceptance speech uh, uh, when he was nominated for second term in 1936 um, said of bankers, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. Uh, this is a fight, and this is a fight with bare knuckles against some of the most powerful people in the world. And once in a great while, ordinary people get sufficiently mobilized to take on powerful economic interests, and sometimes they actually win. So I'm not saying this is easy. It's very, very difficult. But unless ordinary people are mobilized politically, which is, which is what Warren is particularly good at, I think, it doesn't stand a prayer. I mean, Joe Biden is not going to take on either the oil companies or the banks. And um, I think people who think that the problem in America is that all we need is reason and moderation, and we can fix what's broken. What's probably really have missed what happened during the past 40 years. John, you. Um, I want to follow up on the idea of the universal basic income. Or the, you, know, you mentioned the elected permanent fund, which, by the way, um, peaked at $2,000 a person, um, and it's usually between one and 2000 In the earlier years, it was more than that. I, 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 but recently, you're right. Recently, as the price of oil has come down, it's fluctuated between 1000 and 2000 But OK. Please. The, uh, it's got, we've got a lot of oil and very few people, and so I'm wondering, listen, in two hours we're going to have a debate. Um, yep. And I, I'm just, I'd like to hear you comment on let's pick two of the most more dramatic proposals out there. Uh, Warren's talking about a wealth tax, and Yang's talking about UBI. which he wants to finance, his main vehicle would be a value-added tax. And so very different visions of how you would finance a lot of redistribution. I'm just kind of curious as to which of those two resonates with you more. I'm not a huge fan of a UBI, universal basic income. I think most people want jobs. And I think as a supplement, uh, some kind of a check from the government is fine, but it's not a substitute. I think a wealth tax, given the degree of concentration of wealth, if you start at, what is it, 50 billion, 50 million dollars? I mean, that just touches so few people. And it actually raises a lot of money, which is a reflection of just how concentrated wealth has become in this country. I think that's probably a political winner. Uh, I think going back to an idea which was not seen as the least bit radical for 120 years of uh, free public higher education, I think that's smart. And that's a political winner. And what's interesting to me about Warren, and to a lesser extent Sanders, is that ideas that were ridiculed as recently as five years ago, as hopelessly radical and hopelessly uh, impractical, have become mainstream. And that's a very nice reflection of ordinary people starting to connect the dots. That, hey, it didn't have to be like this. Um, the, the, I, I'm not worried about how you pay for this. I mean, I think, I think um, so-called modern monetary theory is a fantasy. You, you can't just print money. On the other hand, Republicans have suddenly decided that deficits don't matter and have given away a $2 trillion tax cut. And if you claw that back and reprogram it, you can do a lot of good stuff with $2 trillion. Um, it's also possible to do what the Fed did uh, during World War II and during um, the financial crisis, which is to, to expand the Fed's own balance sheet and use some of that debt for productive economic purposes rather than to bail out banks. So there, there is a fair amount of running room for expansive policy. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for coming to speak today. Uh, I just have a question about how we can better curb financial speculation. Uh, you mentioned that Keynes saw uh, financial speculation as the main driver of economic inequality across the world. And he offered a lot of instability as well. Instability as well. 
uh, and he offered a lot of global solutions, such as fixing currencies against each other. Uh, but to me, it would seem pretty politically infeasible to offer global solutions today. And you mentioned you know, curbing LBOs or credit default swaps earlier, but do you think there are any real, those seem to be domestic solutions. Do you think there are any real global solutions we can find to that problem? No. I, in fact, um, mo most of the changes in the rules of the game that have been initiated globally have been mischief. have been efforts to undermine the ability of this country to manage a capitalist economy. But the United States of America, because it's still such a very large player, could have taken a very different course uh, beginning in the late 70s. When, when the, the, the first wise guy said, hey, um, I'm going to borrow money and I'm going to collateralize the debt with the assets of the target company, and then I'm going to take over, a minnow is going to take over a whale, Saul Steinberg, Reliance Leasing. You know, the Treasury and the Fed and the SEC could have said, oh, no, you're not. You can't do that. That's a conflict of interest. That violates this, that, and the other thing. But they let this cancer grow. And it metastasized into private equity and hedge funds, most of which contribute absolutely nothing to real economic welfare, whose main function has been to loot retailers and to upstream uh, cash flow from operating companies into the pockets of, of the partners. Um, private equity only exists because of a loophole in the 1940 uh, Investment Company Act. And um, credit default swaps and a whole bunch of other toxic stuff only exists because the regular said, yeah, what the hell, go ahead, have a party. They didn't have to do that. And if different people were in charge, you can have a very different set of ground rules for finance. Now, I'm not talking about the genuinely entrepreneurial part of the economy. I'm just talking about the parasitic financial part of the economy. And that was once very, very nicely regulated. Thank you very much. And funny thing, the real economy just thrived. Well, uh, can I just ask a final question um, to follow up just on that? Because I'm still stuck on one part of your analysis. Um, Let's say, I mean, all of these things are arguable, but let's say you're, uh, you're compelling on the question of uh, regulating financial markets, um, compelling on the problems of austerity, um, and, and uh, so forth. I'm still sort of stuck on the image of putting up barriers to flows of um, capital, intellectual capital, and uh, particularly components in a global system. I mean, you mentioned before, um, you know, people haven't had a, a, a wage increase in 40 years. Well, that may be true, but, you know, 40 years ago, television set was 365 bucks, which was about 6% of your annual income. Today, a television set is 0.6% of your annual income, and you can stream anything from anywhere in the world. Um, they're, they're, and will last forever, you know. Um, I guess I feel like there are advantages to what's been happening in um, the development of, of um, stuff in the global system advantages to the movement of people and intellectual capital in the global system. And when you talk about countries putting up tariffs to protect their own industries, I must say, I get, I get a little queasy, and I feel like um, I'm not even sure you envisioned that. And I wish you'd sort of uh, come back to it and, and say more specifically how you envision it. Thank you for another great question. So stuff is exactly the right word. So stuff has gotten cheaper, thanks to global supply chains and, um, and uh, free capital movement and free movement of um, you know, stuff produced by very cheap labor. So here's the paradox. It's not just cheap labor. Let's be clear. It's not just cheap labor. It's, it's, a, a, global, it's a, whole uh, system. a global strategy for the production of stuff, one part of which may be cheap labor. Fair enough. So here we have this paradox where stuff 
It's cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And that's supposed to make us happier. And at the same time, the most fundamental aspects of what most people would consider a good life have gotten away from more and more people. So, you know, when, when Trump talks about making America great again, he's conflating economics and loss of status and racism. So his image of make America great again is the era when a man could earn a good living on one paycheck and bring that paycheck home to a little wife who served him a hot supper and afford a house in a community with decent schools and a vacation house maybe and one or two cars. And that's been blown to hell. So the problem is over here you have cheap stuff. And over there, you have can't afford a house, schools are a mess, I uh, have to go into debt to go to college unless I have rich parents. Um, my job horizon is kind of fragile in that, you know, if I'm a computer geek, great, man, I'm going to go to the moon. But if I'm anybody else, uh, I'm like, and, unless I'm a graduate of an elite college, um, from anybody else, here's the gig economy, which is like a combined fantasy of Milton Friedman and Karl Marx, where all workers are in a spot market, competing against all other workers all the time to see who will work for the lowest wage. So this is this weird mashup of utopia, with all this great cheap stuff, and dystopia, where people can't get a foot in the American dream. So somehow, you have to square that circle, and we'll do that in Bernie's class tomorrow morning or over dinner, uh, and figure out, can we keep some of the cheap stuff and maybe keep some of the dream? That's a good note to end on. That's a good note to end on. Thank you.